I will try and keep my cursing to a minimum uh, and anything else incredibly offensive. Uh, you might want to say, just know that we're being recorded. So put that caveat out there. Um, well, welcome uh, to the uh, Hillcrest Sustainability Work Group. Uh, thank you all for your time and your interest here. Um, do you, have you all received the agenda? Um, so uh, we'll do an introduction. We'll go through some basic overview on the project itself. Uh, we'll go through this work group uh, process and deliverables. Uh, we will get into a discussion about uh, what we mean when we're talking about sustainability for the purposes of this discussion. Um, we'll touch on the master plan uh, because there is this sort of overarching land use document that will guide this work. Um, and then we'll talk about the sustainability approach, both what we've kind of figured out to date and what is yet to be done. Um, and then we'll close with a little interactive exercise within teams here using a tool I haven't used before, uh, but I think we figured out in the last few days uh, called Miro, M-I-R-O. Uh, it's an online collaboration tool that now they have baked into Teams. Um, so we've been testing it for a couple of days and hopefully it'll be engaging and it won't uh, crap out on us. Um, so uh, with that said, uh, oh, I didn't even hit record, did I? Oh no, I did, good. Uh, Let's go ahead and do some introductions and uh, we'll get into a little icebreaker here. <coughs> um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, mm, and then I will unshare it in a second so we can all see each other while we do introductions. Uh, so this is the Hillcrest Sustainability Work Group. Uh, this is our kickoff meeting. Uh, for those of you that are just meeting the St. Paul Port Authority, uh, we're an economic development agency. We were created by the state legislature 85, 90 years ago now, uh, initially to manage river commerce. And in the 1960s, we were given additional statutory authority to do redevelopment inland. Uh, and by the 1990s, uh, we were involved in really the creation of the modern brownfield era. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, there were some uh, state and federal statutes passed and some funding uh, opportunities made available that made it much easier to clean up uh, these contaminated properties on a voluntary basis, get some liability assurances from the state and the feds, and transact them in the marketplace, which prior to the 1990s was a pretty dicey uh, operation. And so a lot of these sites just sat there with rusty chain link fences around them. Um, because of the environmental liability that could be solved. Um, so our mission uh, is to be a conduit to quality job opportunities, advance sustainable and equitable development, and advocate for river commerce. Um, the city and the Port Authority's goal for this project is to bring a thousand jobs and a thousand housing units to the greater east side. Uh, this is a great opportunity to develop uh, what we would call net new, net positive tax base. Um, this entire 112 acres as a golf course paid property taxes as agricultural land, uh, which was, as you could imagine, quite a bit lower uh, than being taxed at commercial industrial rates. Uh, so this will provide uh, a good deal of net positive revenue to the city to support all the services uh, that at the school district, the, the county, the state, et cetera, uh, all of the public services we rely on uh, are uh, critical to be funded by this tax base. Um, and of course, we've got some pretty uh, high goals for sustainability and equity on the site. Um, those of us that are sort of staff, uh, it's really uh, myself and a couple of hired guns here. Uh, I'm the senior vice president. Uh, I just got a new title a few weeks ago, not that it matters, of sustainable development. Um, Becky and Tiffany, do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Sure. I am Becky Alexander, and I'm thinking we may have enough people on the call here that it might help if everyone muted, if they're not talking, just so we have a little bit less feedback happening. Um, thank you for that. I'm Becky Alexander. I am a carbon and sustainability specialist on the ports team. I'm a licensed architect with an educational and professional background in sustainable design. I um, 
am at LHB, where I've worked for the past 10 years with a focus on sustainability and carbon planning at the community scale. Um, as part of this work, I've been the primary researcher on Minnesota's Regional Indicators Initiative, which includes about 10 years of greenhouse gas emissions inventories for Minnesota cities. I've also worked with a handful of cities on sustainability, resilience, and climate action plans. Um, and I'm on the management team for the state's B3 and SB 2030 programs, which require state bonded construction projects to meet rigorous set of sustainability guidelines and energy standards. So that's a bit of my background and I'm really looking forward to working with you all. Uh, Tiffany. Hi everybody, my name is Tiffany Navratil and I am a licensed landscape architect at LHB as well as an urban designer. I've been with our firm for eight and a half years now um, and on the side, my side hustle is being a adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota College of Design and previously before that I was at the University of St. Thomas in the geology department. So my role on this project is to really help facilitate the larger land use issues and then site design conflicts that may or may not arise depending upon the different disciplines that are interacting with one another. A lot of these sustainability measures take up space. So I'm here to do a lot of listening and to take notes and offer feedback for people if anything comes up that might start having impacts on how space is allocated throughout the site. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, I should tell you by way of background, I've been at the port for uh, 17 years now. Uh, before that, I worked for the North End and Frogtown neighborhoods for their uh, collaborative of their district councils and community development corporations. Uh, doing organizing and economic development work uh, around the redevelopment of a couple of contaminated sites right on Dale and Minnehaha. Um, and uh, in the late 90s, I interned on the Phelan Corridor Initiative on the east side, uh, which helped build Phelan Boulevard, obviously, and clean up a bunch of contaminated land that uh, has helped us bring about 2,000 jobs uh, back to the Phelan Corridor along Phelan Boulevard there. Um, so. Very much of my career, I've spent uh, working on the east side, uh, trying to redevelop and clean up contaminated property. Uh, it's got a very special place in my heart uh, as it's been the majority of my career. So I'm really excited. Uh, I spent the last 10 years managing the cleanup of the old 3M site, uh, now called Beacon Bluff Business Center. Uh, and I'm proud to report we have two final pieces of land there that are uh, under contract or about to be under contract for sale. And then we have sold everything available uh, at Beacon Bluff. And we have hit our goal at Beacon Bluff of bringing a thousand living wage jobs with low barriers to entry uh, back to that site at East 7th and Arcade. Um, I'm going to actually stop sharing this slide um, and we'll do some introductions so we can see each other a little better here. So uh, if we could go around the horn here and just as a little icebreaker, um, why don't you tell us uh, who you are, uh, how long you've lived in St. Paul, uh, or if you don't live in St. Paul, what your affiliation with St. Paul is, uh, and why you decided to get involved with this particular work group. Um, so I'm just, in order to keep track, I'm going to go around the horn on my screen and just call you out. Um, so John Metza, let's start with you, John. Oh, you're muted, John. I grew up in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and this is my ninth state that I've lived in. And uh, I spent 10 years in the U.S. Coast Guard as an aviator. Then I went to the University of Minnesota and got a degree in paper science and engineering, chemical and mechanical. I worked in the paper industry. Then I went to California to do a dot com, which turned into a bot, dot bomb within a year and I moved to Minnesota to take a job in Northfield at a manufacturer as an automation engineer. Then I went to work for uh, Cypress Semiconductor, Silicon Valley based company in, near, in Bloomington. And then I got laid off and decided to start my own company. So that's what I've been doing for the last, uh, since 2002, 20 years, oh my gosh, 20 years. And uh, we're a manufacturer on the east side of electronics, um, about a block from Beacon Bluff, and um, 
I'm a sustainability guy. I, it's my hobby. I'm always working on something with trying to reduce my amount of energy and figure out ways better to recycle things and use less, more natural materials. I love it. I think it's the future. And um, I, uh, I, I, it has to be our future. And I'm hoping to build a building at Hillcrest that will blow everybody away, exceed the, the even goals of the project, sorts of novel innovations. And, uh, and to influence the other uh, light industrial builders in the Twin Cities and maybe around the country use uh, more sustainable products in their buildings. And uh, the number one being wood. Uh, it's back to the future all over again <laughs> <laughs> and it's about time so uh, well, thank you john that's thanks so thank much for joining me. us uh we've been in conversations with john for a little while now and uh really excited to have a business owner focused on sustainability join us for this conversation um let's go to mike i am mike Hirabayashi. um lived in st paul for about 15 years um I'm a volunteer with St. Paul 350. Um, excited to uh, uh, get a lot done on Hillcrest for sustainability. Welcome, Mike. Thank you for joining us. Um, Rebecca. Hi there. Um, my name is Rebecca Nelson. Um, I am uh, work with a couple of district councils and a couple um, organizations around the east side, focused very mainly on the east side here. Um, being that we are on Dakota land, uh, anything and everything that involves land use is very important to me and how it's going to look, um, how we design it now and how it's going to sustain itself and then how it's going to look in 20 years. So this kind of um, totally fits into what I'm, I'm about. Oh. Hi, Chelsea. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Chelsea. I'm Chelsea DeArmond, and I've lived in St. Paul since 97, so I guess it's 25 years, and that's always been on the east side. Um, I live in Dayton's Bluff, and I work um, here at English and Larpenter, so not very far from Hillcrest. And um, I'm with St. Paul 350. We started about four years ago and we're really focused on uh, municipal responses to the climate crisis. And so we're interested in pushing the city to adopt clean energy um, options in, instead of uh, installing new fossil fuel infrastructure whenever there's an opportunity. Um, and let's see, I'm a, I'm a local business owner and we repair old electronics. So I'm interested in the right to repair. And um, uh, I don't live in a very sustainable building right now, but I'd like to change that. And I'm super excited for the idea of the east side leading on sustainability, leading the city. And I feel like Hillcrest is an opportunity to maybe lead the country too. Wonderful, yes. Chelsea. Thanks for joining us. Uh, 25 years ago, I worked for the Office of Environmental Assistance uh, and there were some really smart folks working on design for the environment, uh, product take back, electronics recycling, all sorts of very cool stuff. Uh, a bunch of those folks are still around. Uh, the OEA, as we called it, got sucked into the Pollution Control Agency a number of years ago. Um, but a lot of those same folks I worked with 25 years ago are still doing those same types of activities that really align with what you're talking about. So thank you for, for joining us. Uh, is it Yanni? How Am I saying that yeah. right? You are. I've um, been on the east side of 20, 27 years. Started at Dave's Bluff, um, originally from Philadelphia. I've, I've worked with uh, residential or school over the years for uh, remodeling and uh, sustainability aspect to that. I've gone through the Twin Cities Green Communities uh, training, some seminars, and I've um, uh, done quite a few properties throughout the state. 
Um, and uh, it would be a great opportunity to see, and I'm also on the council, um, great opportunity to see something similar to like a new flat in Philadelphia or something like that here. Uh, Yanni, we're getting a little garbled audio from you. Um, and so if there's anything you can do on your side, I know John just needed to speak into his phone at his phone to get some better audio out of him. Um, if it's a signal issue, maybe. Any better? No. <laughs> uh, no, it, it seems like maybe it might be a, a, a Wi-Fi issue. Maybe try turning yeah. off your camera and see if we get uh, clear audio from you. Is it sound better? I think that is. Uh, try to repeat your last couple of comments there. Sure. Let's see if that. I've been on I've been side for uh, 27 years prior to that date, bluff, and uh, I'm on the two council, um, originally in Philadelphia, um, and I have done a lot of work with Greater Minnesota Housing Fund, um, renovating uh, unsustainably uh, uh, houses. Uh, through uh, SP funds uh, for years, and then uh, also and applying uh, Minnesota Green Communities uh, agenda to them. Um, and it would be nice to see something like Onion Fest uh, out in Philadelphia here on these. Awesome. We, uh, that's about uh, 40 to 50 percent better audio, Yanni. I think we, we, we caught you. Uh, we're still a little garbled, but it's workable if there's uh, no other improvement. Um, okay, we, the, the musical chairs, uh, shuffled here on me, Chelsea, Mike, we did, Yanni, Rebecca, we did, Matt. Hey, everybody, um, Matt Dahl, I, uh, um, have lived, uh, in a house, uh, not far from Hillcrest, um, for about five years now. Uh, actually, I think I might be the closest one here to the site. It's about a, an eight minute walk from my house. Um, so that was one reason that I, I wanted to get involved is I really, you know, care about making the site a really, really uh, great spot um, and very sustainable. And um, I work for the Minnesota Environmental Partnership, which is uh, a coalition of environmental organizations. So we're very interested in uh, sustainable investments, uh, renewable energy and all, all that kinds of stuff and making sure that gets supported at the, especially at the state level. So um, really interested to see how this will go and, and how um how we and other organizations might help awesome uh great to have you here matt and uh, i'm familiar with mep and uh appreciate the fact that we've got the horsepower of uh some advocacy organizations here at the table um i think we're uh to Keeley. yeah can you hear me again crystal clear Okay, great. Sorry, my on my end, my Microsoft Teams is pretty slow, but um, I'm just going to keep my camera off for this. Um, hello, my relatives. My name is Keely Shiaka. I'm the environmental justice educator and organizer at the Lower Failing Creek Project based on the east side of St. Paul. I've been with the organization since I graduated um, college last spring, um, and my work primarily focuses right now on developing our environmental justice uh, framework for our organization, raising awareness about um, pollution issues <clears throat> and, <clears throat> sorry, access to green space um, on the east side, as well as um, right now developing a curriculum about environmental justice for middle school students. And um, <clears throat> as a Dakota woman, um, kind of like Rebecca was saying, I, um, sustainability is just so like baked into our life ways so that's always been something that's very important to me and um i'm happy to be a part of this group welcome thank you all did we make it did we miss anyone i don't think so okay how about russ oh russ geez sorry i kept staring at your picture here and it's like oh i'm so glad russ is here uh russ why don't you please uh introduce yourself no worries, Monty. Uh, hey, everybody. Russ Stark. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer working at Mayor Carter's office here in St. Paul. Been doing that for four years. Was a St. Paul City Council member for 10 years before that. And actually, I, I've known Monty since before he started at the port. So I think we're getting pretty old, Monty. But um, <laughs> good to be with all of you today. And um, the city is super excited about the opportunity here at Hillcrest. And in part, this conversation dates back to a conversation that 
Monty and I had a few years ago about what the potential was for this site and could we uh, aspire to things like net zero. So excited about uh, the work of this group. Thank you, Russ. Uh, thanks for your uh, joining us here and for your partnership and friendship over the last 20 plus years. Uh, as long as I keep my head shaved, you can't see all the grapes. So <laughs> nobody really knows all of it. Um, so let me go back to the slides here and let's get through some of this stuff. Um, so there will be unfortunately a little bit of talking at you for this next chunk of the meeting. I apologize for that. We do want this to be an interactive uh, process, um, but we need to kind of level set and get everyone up to the same page here. Um, so your role uh, in this exercise, can you see the slide here? Thank you. Um, you're really here to represent uh, your neighbors, your community, the city of St. Paul, uh, folks that either aren't uh, able or interested or knowledgeable about sustainability. Um, and so you're carrying water for uh, a lot of other folks here. Um, and so to the extent you bring information to the table that's informed by other stakeholders, be they residents, business owners, advocacy groups, organizations you're familiar with, by all means, this is a great place to funnel uh, uh, the input from others and feedback from others into this process as well. Um, but you uh, you are were selected to serve on this uh, work group because of your interest and knowledge in the subject. So um, the expectations for this group is that we're going to meet once a month. Um, there will be some homework in between the sessions. Um, and following this series of, I can't believe, I can't remember if it's five or six meetings, um, we will, over the course of the development at various times, uh, need to activate advocacy, um, education, engagement opportunities around a variety of things. Uh, when, by the time we get to the end of this meeting, you're going to realize there's a lot of work yet to do, and it's going to take a lot of hands lifting a lot of weight. Um, so I appreciate your uh, uh, engagement here. Um, Tiffany Navratro with uh, LHB. Uh, she will be the point person for any or all deliverables that you're asked for. Uh, they're helping us keep all this information organized. Uh, oh, we already did the group introduction, so I'm going to skip that. A um, little background on Hillcrest. Uh, it's a brownfield. Um, unfortunately, for many decades, they put mercury fungicide on the golf course. Uh, it was very commonly used on the greens to prevent uh, winter mold growth. Uh, to from infesting the golf greens. Um, so as the property was transacted a few years before we bought it to the pipe fitters union, uh, there was some environmental testing done at the time of that acquisition and this mercury was identified. Uh, when we bought it from the pipe fitters for redevelopment, we did our own due diligence. Um, and when you see a little bit of contamination, uh, you know enough to look more broadly for more contamination. And unfortunately on this golf course, they did use this mercury containing product, not just on the greens, but on almost all the fairways and almost all the tee boxes. It's in almost all the wetlands. Um, so in the zero to three foot range of the topsoil, uh, there are unsafe levels of mercury contamination in the soil that have to be remediated. Uh, to leave it as is, it literally is not safe for human health and the environment to leave it as is. Uh, a, a bank would not lend on this property unless a cleanup happens. Uh, a public organization like us would not allow, and right now we can't allow public access to the site uh, because of the environmental liability associated with someone eating, ingesting, or inhaling the mercury molecules that are in the dirt right now. Um, so it's, it's a blight. It was going to sit here until someone figured all this out. Uh, that's usually our role at the Port Authority. We're a buyer of distressed properties, sort of de land developer of last resort, if you will. Um, our initial take uh, was to do a market study and see what can we physically deliver in the marketplace. Uh, the market study came back and told us that the site can absorb a thousand housing units and a thousand jobs. Um, part, of, part of that knowledge comes from our track record of what we've just completed at Beacon Bluff uh, over the last 10 years, delivering a thousand jobs. Those thousand jobs are part of the Port Authority's portfolio. Um, since the 1990s, we've built uh, 21 business centers with over 550 companies and over 25,000 jobs in the city of St. Paul. Um, so you'll see these Port Authority business centers on these old brownfields. 
they really do make up a good chunk of the commercial industrial backbone of St. Paul's economy. Um, we are just wrapping up a city-led master planning process. It's been going on for two years. Uh, two years of engagement, uh, literally thousands of residents of the city of St. Paul have participated over that course of time. Uh, it really is about land use and set out the blueprint for land use in large zoning blocks. Um, it also, there is a chapter in there on sustainability, which the folks in the planning department really looked to us because as soon as we got involved, um, I'm a U.S. Green Building Council board member uh, here in the state of Minnesota, past president of the Minnesota chapter. This is my uh, passion and my background and expertise. And so as soon as we acquired the site, uh, we began conversations with other smart sustainability professionals like Russ saying, what's the high bar here? What, what if we shoot for the moon on this one? Um, and I think you'll see that's what we're trying to do, but we need a lot of help to make sure we get it right. Uh, project timeline, uh, the master land use plan was just released by the planning commission for a public for public review uh, in front of a public hearing on Friday, May 4th. I believe that's correct. March, uh, March. sorry, March 4th, yes. <laughs> oh, God. Planning Commission public hearing on March 4th. Uh, those are the kinds of uh, events and places that it is really helpful to have folks that are supportive of one aspect or many aspects of the project to show up. Um, uh, we will have detractors uh, that don't like some or many portions of what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so support is definitely needed in those public hearing uh, engagements. Um, once it, uh, May 22nd, I want to say, uh, Tiffany, um, we wind up in front of city council. Uh, there's another set of public, there's another public hearing in front of city council leading to a city council approval of the master plan uh, in May. Uh, by August, with those approvals, by August, we want to try and get a permit to begin the remediation, that cleaning up of the contamination uh, in some cases, it will be trucked off site and put in a safe permitted landfill. Uh, in some instances, we are allowed to reuse it safely under uh, a road or under a parking lot. Uh, we've consolidated some of these materials under buildings before, um, et cetera. Uh, but the Pollution Control Agency at the state and the Minnesota Department of Agriculture are overseeing all of that cleanup uh, where every square yard, uh, uh, cubic yard, excuse me, of dirt goes. Uh, we have to document it. They have to sign off on it. Um, and Minnesota is one of the foremost uh, brownfield redevelopment states in the country. We really led the way in the early 90s in showing the rest of the country how to do this safely. Um, so we've got a good track record of doing exactly that. Um, there's about a year worth of dirt work, just moving all the dirt where it needs to be, getting the contamination out of the way, um, as you can imagine, tee boxes that have 45 degree angle side slopes uh, don't really work very well for much of anything other than hitting a golf ball. Um, so there's a lot of grading that has to happen to make the site developable. Um, so fall 2022 to fall 2023, we're doing remediation and grading. By fall of 23, we would like to let an additional contract to build the roads and utilities. By the time we're building the roads and utilities, we literally could be ready for uh, developers or business owners to start building buildings. Um, they may not have a road to their site yet, uh, but they could, we could uh, literally sell them a lot and they could start building a building while the roads are being built around them. Um, work group timeline. Um, so this is obviously meeting one, uh, introduction and goals. Uh, meeting number two, uh, we're going to talk further about something called Lead for Communities, and that is our overarching framework. You're going to learn a lot about that in this process. Uh, meeting three, we're going to talk about how do we get beyond Lead for Communities. Uh, it doesn't touch on everything. It touches on most of the stuff we would do uh, as a land developer, but uh, possibly not everything, and that is for this group uh, to determine and discuss. Um, meeting four, uh, it's TBD. It's not TBD because we couldn't think of anything to talk about. It's TBD because we wanted this group to help populate what that conversation is focused on. And our exercise at the end of the meeting will help us get there. Uh, meeting number five, uh, we hope to finalize de deliverables. And this comment at the bottom that the engagement may continue to be on the scheduled meetings, that's just a reference to this ad hoc need 
to potentially bring this group together. Uh, hey, we've got an EV car charging model that's been brought in front of us uh, by a vendor or an engineer, whoever. Um, can you help us think through this? Um, so really kind of a brain trust. Um, one of the past presidents of the Port Authority used to call it a kitchen cabinet. Uh, we need a kitchen cabinet of sustainability professionals we can go to uh, to vet some of these concepts before we start building stuff. Um, work group, group deliverables. Um, so three things are two, two main things we're trying to get out of here. Uh, a series of documented conversations that would be publicly available, uh, the minutes, the presentation materials, the videos, of, video recordings of this team's meeting, for example. Um, and LHB will be helping us document this conversation uh, of our findings and priorities. There's probably half a dozen at least different controlling documents that will result in what gets built here uh, that will guide the design, construction, and operations of this community. Um, and all of those have sustainability components or could have sustainability components. Um, because we've been looking at this for two years throughout the master planning exercise, while the city was working on land use and zoning, uh, we were trying to figure out, can we deliver on the city's goal of building this entire site at net zero? Um, so Russ, uh, thankfully, I think I asked him for three months a couple of years ago, I said, give us three months and we'll see if we can figure this out. <laughs> Well, it's taken 18 months, uh, but we kind of have figured it out. We just don't know if we can pay for it all uh, in terms of building the entire site net zero. Um, so we'll get into all that. Um, so sustainable, this is a sustainability work group. I, I have some issues with this as a practitioner um, and as a US Green Building Council board member, we were just talking about this on a regional call yesterday. Um, as I was trained and as the United Nations and others uh, that work in this field talk about sustainable development, we're talking about really that three-legged stool of equity, environment, and economy. Um, all of those things have to balance to be successful from a sustainable development perspective. Um, and you see the Venn diagram, you see the three components as written on the slide. Um, we really here today, uh, this work group it really here is to talk about the sustainability component or the environmental component of the three-legged stool. We obviously are worried about all of them. Uh, we just wrapped up work with a cohort uh, working on equity issues within our workforce agreements, which are the controlling document uh, to guide uh, the equitable delivery of living wage jobs to the site. Uh, so we've got different groups focused on different components. The focus of this work group is really on the sustainability or the environmental leg of the sustainable development stool. Um, questions about any of that? I feel like you're probably all kind of up to speed on most of that. OK, um, so the, I mentioned this master plan. Uh, the, the master plan has to conform to what's called the city's 2040 comprehensive plan. Um, and this site is actually called out in the comprehensive plan uh, and it requires a few things and it requires these things bulleted uh, from page 36 on the comp plan in the comp plan. Um, there is a neighborhood node required uh, at this site. It's literally in the in the comp plan uh, needs to occur within the northern one third of the site uh, closer to Larpenter McKnight more or less. So you'll see that reflected in some of the land use diagrams. Uh, ensure equitably distributed amenities, uh, employment and housing, uh, infrastructure for all ages and abilities. Uh, this next bullet, the efficient, adaptable and sustainable uh, development and land use patterns and processes. That's really the, the guts of what this group is focused on as it relates to the comprehensive plan. Um, and the Port Authority's Economic Development Organization is very interested in creating quality full time livable wage jobs. Uh, that are attainable and achievable uh, by the local population. And this people-centered urban design uh, is a big focus in the comp plan. Um, this slide here shows the contamination uh, that I mentioned previously. And you can see it, it kind of looks like the golf course, right? You can see the fairways, you can see the tee boxes, you can see the greens. Um, in addition to the mercury that's kind of ubiquitous throughout the site, uh, there are areas where they were doing maintenance. Uh, they had storage sheds for various pieces of equipment. And of course, 
oil and gas and all sorts of stuff has been spilled. Things have been demolished and put in piles behind some sheds. And so that's the, the, the Department of Agriculture is regulating the mercury contamination because it was a agricultural product applied per label instructions. The Pollution Control Agency regulates all the other contamination that is not mercury or an agricultural product. Um, so this is relatively hot off the press. Um, so back in November, December, the final master plan uh, was being decided upon by a community advisory committee uh, that was a committee of the St. Paul Planning Commission. Um, we started to have to turn that into, okay, what buildings could fit on these blocks? Because the land use plan in the master plan is just watercolor blobs, kind of big colored blobs of land use. But there's wetlands up here that have to be taken into account. There's grading issues. There's roads that have to be connected. Uh, so how does all of that work? And, and what would, given the master plan, what would a sensible approach to how these buildings would lay out look like? Um, that said, the Port Authority uh, does what we would call speculative land development. We have to clean all this stuff up, stuff up, install all this infrastructure, generally before we have any buyers in the marketplace. Because as you saw, it's going to take two years to get ready for them. Um, most businesses, uh, most tenants don't know what they're going to be doing with their real estate two years in the future. 18 months, maybe 12 months, probably six months, they better. Um, but we had to start speculating so we get the roads right, we get the utilities in the right spaces, et cetera. Um, so this map here uh, does now depict uh, a thousand dwelling units uh, that would conform to the zoning that the master plan calls for. It does depict a thousand jobs. The, uh, we know that because we have job density requirements. So if we know a certain piece of, of dirt is this big because of our density requirements, both for the building and the, and the jobs, we know how many people would wind up working on that piece of dirt. Um, so we know that 55 acres, we can translate into approximately 1,000 jobs. Um, we have uh, affirmed, and actually it's in a city ordinance that allowed us to acquire the site, that we will uh, provide, design, build, and maintain 15 acres of passive open space. Uh, this could be areas around the wetlands, uh, the stormwater, trails, et cetera, stormwater amenities, boardwalks, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, we also agreed to give five acres uh, to the city for a park, a city park, which is this green area up here. Um, and the Parks Department will start working on that later this year. They'll go through their own planning and programming process for that. Um, so while the city was wrapping up its master planning process, uh, and they had done two years of community engagement about the master plan. Uh, May, June, and throughout the summer and fall, we went out and started conducting community engagement through surveys and focus groups. Uh, a BIPOC-owned data firm called Monocat Data uh, did this work for us in community, hitting community events, businesses, uh, every, every place they could, really shoe leather work, uh, to do some surveying and focus groups. You see these top three community concerns as it relates to sustainability being about water quality, air quality, and climate change. Uh, and you see some quotes from folks that were involved in those surveys and focus groups. Uh, all of the photos you see here uh, are literally photos. Uh, we had a photographer hit the neighborhood and get photos of folks from the neighborhood living in the neighborhood. So these are not high stock photo uh, shots. These are your neighbors. Um, so this is the master plan, and this is what I was saying. These, we had to turn these relatively two-dimensional pancake watercolor blobs into places where buildings could go. Um, that's not completed. That's got to go through a whole nother, you know, six months yet of design review by the city before we could get a permit to even turn dirt, uh, let alone build a road. So a lot of design work yet to be done, um, but this is generally how the land use lays out. You see this multicolor, I don't know if that's a Simon, what was that game, Simon Says, uh, or a Microsoft logo, but where this letter C is here, um, that's what's designated as the community node. So it's meant to abut the public park, the city park, some higher density housing, and the node is supposed to be a more activated, engaged, dense uh, public realm type area as well. So plazas, public art, that kind of stuff. 
Um, the master plan does have a sustainability section. Um, uh, Tiffany, do you know, did we actually email them this deck as well? I can't remember. Not okay, yet. we, we'll we will email. The website. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you this deck. This is a clickable link uh, to the, ma the draft master plan, which has the sustainability chapter. It's, I think it's two pages actually, so it's not a ton of reading. Um, but it talks about carbon neutrality, uh, talks about the ecology of the site, uh, waste stream and material management, and stormwater management. Uh, talks about a lot of other things, but those are some of the highlights. Um, so lead for communities. Um, so LEED is a certification of the U.S. Green Building Council. It's been around for a long time. You might be familiar with it. Um, and as we were talking about, there are today, I think, 70 billion square feet of LEED certified buildings in the world. Um, we and others have seen a real reaction just in the last year or two, picking up in relation to the marketplaces, specifically the capital markets and investors, reaction to what's called ESG investing, environmental social governance investing. Um, and the markets are looking for signals and certifications that their investments are green. Uh, they're actually getting ahead of us because they're worried about what their buildings are going to be worth 10 years from now uh, and forecasting what politics and regulation might look like 10 years from now. Um, and it looks like you better have a green building or you're going to suffer a brown discount. So. We very early on knew and were asked to have a sustainability framework for the site. Um, and we believe that a lead for communities certified site with lead certified buildings on top of it creates a really unique uh, appeal in the marketplace. Um, we looked at lead for campus. We looked at lead for neighborhood development. We looked at eco districts. We looked at a bunch of different platforms and for many more reasons that I'm happy to talk to you about over beer. Lead for Communities was the, uh, the framework suggested. Um, it does align with, these are the United Nations uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So there's a clear react relation there. Um, in the last couple of years, we've been working with Lead for Communities. We've really learned the uh, metrics and the credits in Lead for Communities really do dovetail well into these various ESG platforms. You've probably heard of the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures. Uh, Lead for Communities gets you to a place where you can make certifications and disclosures uh, within the financial markets. Um, this is the Lead for Communities checklist. We're going to spend some time on this in this interactive exercise here in a little bit. Um, but what I can tell you is from a land development standpoint, it it more or less touches on about all the stuff you're going to have to do as a land developer. You're going to have to look at natural systems and ecology. You're going to have to worry about transportation and land use, water efficiency, energy and greenhouse gases, carbon emissions, um, materials and resources, and quality of life. Um, and you can get some extra points for innovation, et cetera, um, which we have several innovation credits we're going after. Um, so this is what's called uh, this checklist we submitted with a whole plan behind it for what we call what they call pre-certification. Um, so we told them here's the plan. Here's why we think we can say yes to these prerequisites. Here's why we think we can say we're going to get uh, four points on walkability and bikeability. We literally had to tell US Green Building Council here's the plan uh, and a bunch of that was driven by the uh, master planning process, because uh, a lot of these items were related to streets, roads, utilities, land use. Um, a lot of it was projections based on what we're going to require for the ground up development. I will point out that uh, the greenhouse gas emissions credit here down at the bottom, you see 19 points uh, out of 19 points. It's the most heavily weighted credit in the system, in the framework. Uh, and if you get 19 out of 19 points, you are demonstrably net zero energy, net zero carbon for scope one and scope two emissions on site. Um, we are unaware of anyone else in the country that has hit that mark. Uh, the international uh, work group I've been on for the last uh, several months now, um, the folks that are getting points that high in other countries are really getting them because of their climate zone because they're in such a temperate climate zone, they don't have to do much heating and they don't have to do much cooling. So they kind of have an advantage in how the math is calculated. 
Um, so you total this all up, you see this 88 points over here, which would be platinum. Uh, we would be the first pre-certified Lead for Communities platinum site in the country. Uh, and we would be one of only a handful if we actually get certified. So pre-certification means they believe our plan. Uh, certified means we implemented the plan. And we're going to talk through that and get your help on figuring out what on that list are you guys interested in? What do you think we're doing good? What do we need to strive harder for? So with that, I think I turn it over to Becky here, who is our expert on carbon emissions. Thank you, Monty. Are there any kind of clarifying questions that anybody's had while you've been listening to some of the background that Monty's shared? All right, then we can keep moving. Super okay. clear, Monty, good work. Awesome. So you've heard from Monty that reducing the carbon impact at Hillcrest was identified early on as a priority for this project. It was identified by the port, by the city, and by community members. So we really wanted to dig in to that lead credit for energy and greenhouse gas emissions management by conducting a greenhouse gas analysis and calculating what it would actually take to get to a carbon-free community. And carbon free can mean different things to different people. So our working definition is that each year after the community is fully developed, it offsets as much greenhouse gas as is emitted due to the activities that are taking place within the community's geographic boundaries. And we'll get into a little bit more detail on, on what those activities are on, on the next slide. But as we were starting this, what's been a multi-year effort already and we'll, and we'll keep going. We knew that a, the carbon piece of the equation would need to be balanced with other priorities for the community. So we asked Monty to fill in the blank of this sentence here. The St. Paul Port Authority supports a carbon-free community at Hillcrest to the extent that it, and they came back with, reduces social and economic disparities in St. Paul, improves the marketability of the development for private investment, can be accomplished without pricing the site out of the market, and brings joy to our community. So those are some principles that we can continue to keep in our minds when we're talking not just about the carbon piece of the sustainability equation, but you know any of the sustainability strategies that we're addressing. So Monty, let's head, yep. Um, so. We conducted a greenhouse gas analysis in line with LEED's requirements and with the national protocol developed by ICLEI. So this accounts for greenhouse gases emitted due to building energy use, street and outdoor lighting, transportation, water, wastewater, and waste management all occurring within the community's boundaries. And this within the community's boundaries is a really important distinction. So in Leeds' eyes, um, kind of stops caring about a car's emissions as soon as it leaves the site or um, the waste as soon as it leaves the site unless it's managed on site, um, which we're not you know, proposing to manage waste or wastewater in this um, golf course size site. So we actually have also looked at emissions that follow community-based ba vehicle trips and community-based waste to their destinations, to where um, they end up, to where that waste is treated, to where those cars are coming from or going, um, and, and can share that level of detail in a future meeting if that's something that the group would like to see as well. But here, we're just using that lead definition of things that are happening within that 112 acres. So we see this baseline of nine short tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per capita, which is looking at a combination of the residents on the site and the working population on the site. And that baseline is based on St. Paul as a whole in 2018. And it's showing a pretty typical split between building energy use, those two orange bars, which is about two thirds of the total, vehicle travel, the green, which is about 30% of the total, and then waste and wastewater, which is less than 5% of the total. But when we go to the business as usual column, the next bar, 
since we have nearly all of the transportation and waste management happening outside of this 112 acres, the business as usual case is almost entirely building energy. And that's even also cut significantly due to strategies that we expect to happen based just on existing policies, plans, and market trends. So building energy codes will be enforced and will continue to get more aggressive over time. Excel Energy's electricity will come from cleaner and cleaner sources for their integrated resource planning. So with cleaner electricity expected from Excel by 2030, which is what this business as usual year is representing, the majority of emissions are from heating and fossil fuel based natural gas. So our proposed design to get to carbon free includes eliminating as much natural gas as possible by using a district energy system for heating and cooling. So the system uses electricity to create and move thermal energy and stores it in the aquifer between seasons. And we're definitely happy to explore this topic more um, in future meetings. Again, if that's something that you want to dig into. In addition to electrifying the site, um, we have modeled highly energy efficient buildings that go far beyond the energy code and we're working on a way to meet all of these electricity needs with on-site solar on rooftops and and some on the site itself on the transportation side we definitely know that there's a lot that can be done to support electric vehicles um, certainly through ev charging infrastructure but probably beyond that and we've just scratch the surface in terms of other ideas for low carbon transportation, whether it's um, supporting more multimodal or car sharing, um, last mile, those types of things. So that's another topic that if is in, of interest to this group, we'd love to dig more into with you. Um, I should point out where it says here at the bottom, many of these strategies are well defined, others are still being developed. The same goes true is true for this scorecard. There are some of these that are kind of a rote exercise, right? It's we got to get from A to B and that gets us two points because we make one simple decision. Uh, there are some of these like resilience planning, I'll point out. Um, we got six. We're saying we're going to get six points because we've said we'll do a resilience plan. We haven't done a resilience plan. We've committed to do one. Um, and those are the things. I mean, there are multiple uh, examples of that throughout the scorecard where we have stated our intention to do things, but the actual strategies and the details haven't been figured out yet. So don't think we've got this all baked. We've just convinced ourselves in USGBC we've got this all baked. Okay. So we, we do feel like Lead for Communities does provide a pretty holistic framework for incorporating sustainability into the community's development, but we also recognize its limitations. So it's it's really focused on strategies that can be implemented at the scale of a whole city, and it's a international program. So any city across the entire globe and during the planning phases of the project. Since the port has a kind of unique level of influence at Hillcrest compared to what you know any city might have over the development that happens within the city, we have some ability to go beyond what's included in Lead for Communities. So as one example, while Lead for Communities focuses more on the infrastructure des design, we can actually be a lot more prescriptive about sustainability requirements for the private developments as well. And this for this, we use a tool that Monty will describe um, on the next slide. But another example is going beyond LEED's thresholds for items like EV charging infrastructure. So LEED is looking for 2% of public parking spaces to include EV supply equipment, but we're saying, okay, well, that's well and good, but what we really need is EV charging equipment at each of these residential properties, at each of these um, job centers as well, and at higher rates than 2%. So looking into what, th what that could mean and how it could be achieved and who um, should be partnered with in order to achieve it. Um, and then another example is just looking at strategies related to actual operations, such as tracking ongoing energy and water use. So we're hoping 
we we are addressing some of these lead beyond lead strategies within the current documentation for the project and we're also hoping that this work group can help us identify and prioritize any remaining gaps in our sustainability approach kind of after we've gone through lead we'll ask now what's missing what have you been wanting to talk about that's not covered in this framework that we haven't talked about um, and the other types of documentation i think we do have a little another you know time for questions if there if there are any clarifying questions yeah. about questions about the carbon emissions greenhouse gas stuff um big picture uh in order to pull this off we have to be in the marketplace telling buyers of land who in our world are generally business owners more than developers it's more folks like john than real estate investors. There will be some of each, um, but we'll be in the marketplace telling both of those groups, um, you have to build buildings that are 80 or 90% more efficient than a 2003 baseline. You have to cover your rooftop uh, with solar to the maximum extent possible as a requirement, uh, and you have to hook up to this district energy system. Um, it's 12 to 14 megawatts of solar we need to deploy out here. Um, much of that, uh, cost we can finance uh, all in the current bullet uh, for this exercise is about a hundred million dollars. Um, it's not necessarily new spending. Um, people are going to build buildings. We're going to build energy infrastructure. What are we building? Where are we allocating those dollars and how are we setting up uh, utility payments and rewards? Um, so of the 100 million, I don't know if you've heard this, Russ, probably not. Uh, uh, Pete Klein and I had a conversation a week ago looking at it. And of the 100 million, uh, 50 million of it is PACE eligible. Uh, it's PACE eligible financing of energy efficient buildings and PACE eligible financing of rooftop solar. Um, he's, he's jazzed about it. Uh, we just have to find the right bank that can put the money up. <laughs> um, so uh, there's, there's a ways to go. Um, Becky mentioned this other tool we use. So uh, from the 1960s, the port used uh, protective covenants, restrictive covenants. You might have these if you live in a subdivision. Um, the subdivision I grew up in out in the Burbs, uh, my neighbors used it to figure out that my skateboard ramp in the backyard was out of compliance, right? Uh, <laughs> Over the years, the Port Authority in the early days used these to control aesthetics, to make sure these business centers were aesthetically pleasing and consistent. Mm -hmm. Starting in 2003, uh, we started introducing sustainable design components to these covenants. Uh, it's a legal document. You can see from the example on the screen here, it is a very legal document. It's recorded at the county. It runs with the title to the land. Uh, so everyone, uh, current owners and successor owners, are bound by it. Um, and Every time we develop one of these set of covenants for a new business center, we ratchet it up. Um, the covenants can be more restrictive than zoning and other regulations. They can't allow, they can't be less restrictive. We can't cut, we can't cut it easy on some zoning or regulatory requirement because of these covenants, but we can go above and beyond. Um, and so there are places uh, like the, the EUI, the, the energy use intensity, the energy efficiency metric of the building. That could be written into the covenants. Uh, the need for rooftop solar, that could be written into the covenants. Um, so this is one place uh, where we have looked at, okay, how would we bake the requirements of LEED and our other sustainability aspirations into legal requirements that would result in ground up construction? So thus far we have said, because it gets us some points in LEED for communities, that all buildings bigger than 5,000 square feet will be at least LEED certified. Uh, that's not the highest bar, that's actually the lowest bar within LEED, but we've never had that requirement in these covenants before. Uh, we would require that rooftops be PV ready, but in essence in the marketplace, not only will they have to be ready, they will all have to install the PV. Um, and they would, by covenant and by purchase contract, they would be required to hook up to the district energy system. Um, you know, you pay for a district energy system, uh, by the rate payers, the users paying energy bills to pay off the debt that was used to build the system. So we got to have people hook up to it. They, they don't get a choice. So some of the work of this group will inform 
uh, what are now just draft sustainability portions of covenants. Um, but that's really some of the detail level we need to get uh, to here fairly quickly. Uh, milestone targets, uh, district energy system. Uh, that's a big one. Um, we have been going after and working with Evergreen Energy on developing a concept for an aquifer thermal energy storage system. Uh, the one that you may have heard, uh, it's, a similar, it's the same technology being deployed at Towerside. Um, Excel may very well have their own technology they want to talk about, Russ. Um, so that's maybe something we could uh, talk about offline. Um, I think it was that Chelsea, was that you had a comment? Uh, you know, I don't know that the state, because these covenants are not, uh, they're not related to legislative control by the city. They're not related to the city's police power to zone and control land use. They're really uh, land covenants. Uh, private, private parties can enact these same kind of covenants between themselves. And so I don't know the state can come in and actually uh, preempt our ability to do these covenants. Um, so we got to build a district energy system of some sort. Uh, there's at least one option we've been running at. There could be a second backup. Um, we have put a $100 million price tag on it, and that's for everything. That's the EV, that's the super efficient buildings, that's the solar, that's the district energy system. But again, it's not all new money. It's not $100 million of new investment. It's $100 million of retargeting capital that's going to be deployed to build stuff out here, but building carbon free, zero carbon stuff instead of super fossil fuel stuff. Um, we, we're going to need city council and administration support to finance some portions of this. We don't know exactly what those are, but that's why Russ is on the call to help us run that gauntlet. Um, and of course, we, uh, we're going to go out to the marketplace now that there is a final draft master plan in the next 30 days here. Uh, we have been talking to the development community behind the scenes about these initiatives. Um, and there are going to be some folks that are going to say, I'm not doing that. Uh, I'm not coming to St. Paul because you're going to make me do this stuff. Uh, this is not going to be the site for everyone. And so some of those businesses that want to build a low quality, energy inefficient building and don't want to put solar on their roof, I'm sorry, but they might say no to us and they might wind up in Lino Lakes or Egan or Rogers or wherever. And that's just the, the fact of the matter. We believe there is enough support in the marketplace that we can pull this off. We don't have to convince the entire marketplace this can work. We have to convince a handful of light industrial job dense businesses this can work. And we have to convince a handful of housing developers this can work. And by and large, those two communities are getting real smart about this real quick because of this rise in ESG investing I mentioned earlier. Um, Work group priorities. Are we are we to the cool thing? I think we're to the cool thing. Let's let's check one more time to see if there are any questions okay. about any of what Monty and I have covered. Russ. Yeah, I, Monty, do you have a sense? The appreciate the description that the hundred million is not all additional resource. Yeah. Do you have a sense of kind of what the what the baseline expense would would be? without some of these features, sort of the the, the delta, if all those systems were so built in a the, more business as usual way. So the, the true sort of net add. Right. You know, I think where it really pops up um, is the delta to build the super efficient buildings. Um, we, we've calculated it. We know it costs uh, seven bucks a square foot more to build a net zero industrial building than it does a uh, net zero and then a conventional build. Um, so uh, seven bucks on 900,000 square feet, there's 6.3 million of really new spending, new investment that the market otherwise would not have spent. Now that said, it, it still is tricky because that 6.3 million eventually pays for itself because of the lower energy costs. Um, but it's going to take 20 or 25 years. The business decision makers we sell land to, they make decisions based on five-year paybacks or seven-year paybacks. And so we, we're talking to the Federal Department of Energy right now. Uh, Russ, I should update you on our conversations over the last couple months with their loan programs office. They've got some huge federal guarantees. They've got a variety of tools for patient capital. So again, it's 
it's not necessarily somebody writing a check for these dollar amounts. It's finding the enlightened uh, investor, the enlightened business owner, appraiser, banker who can see that longer term and get there. And, and frankly, we're breaking new ground, but there are people all over the country. Uh, I, I met with a bunch of them out in New York at the Getting to Zero conference uh, back in October. And it's realist, commercial real estate folks are realizing they have to do this now or their, their buildings will be worthless in the very near future. Um, so there, there is a true delta, Russ, and uh, really over the next six months or so is what we've got to figure that out and plug those holes. So. Uh, we are kicking off that finance uh, subgroup, uh, and I believe you've been invited to uh, help us meet with the finance types to plug the holes here, as it were. Thanks. Um, I think we're, I saw your comment, Chelsea, and I think this next exercise is going to allow you to highlight uh, that interest, that topical interest, but we want to get into it because we're not sure if it's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> It'll work. Okay, so tell me what to do here, guys. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Don't, don't, no, don't stop sharing yet because we do want to cover some okay. ground rules first. Okay. Um, and thank you for folks who are um, chatting in the chat too. I think we'll have a chance to add those comments to, to this Miro board as well. But basically, we are um, trying to plan for our next meeting. So we've framed it up as talking about the project's pathway to lead platinum certification. And um, we want to definitely be a lot more conversational, get a lot more input from all of you. This is, we know, been a lot of talking at you in order to, to get everybody up to speed. But since LEAD is such an expansive framework, we'd rather really dig into the details on a few key topics that you really want to talk about rather than talking really superficially about all of them. So now we are hoping that you can identify your priorities for our next discussion. Um, Monty will be sharing in a minute a Miro board that will have little stars on it. So you um, will be able to drag stars to the lead credits that you're most interested in talking about. Um, we're giving each of you a budget of six stars and you can use them any way you want, so you can feel free to put all six on one topic if you really want to make sure that it's talked about. Otherwise, spread them around. Um, feel free to ask any questions about what things mean as we get started. I'll throw a link to the um, lead rating system. It's a long PDF in the chat in case anybody really wants to dig into what those uh, what those topics mean. Um, Feel free to change your answers based on what people are talking about or where other people are putting their stars. This isn't a test. Um, and then you can also document any thoughts you're having, like some of those that were going into the chat uh, using the post it feature. So if you specifically want to dig into district energy, for example, you can put a star next to greenhouse gas emissions credit and have a post it saying really want to talk about district energy um, system. Another couple of reminders, we if you're not seeing the topics that you want to focus on, you can add it as a post it note or ask us if you think that it might fit into a specific credit, but you're not sure where. But if it doesn't fit in, we'll make sure to save those ideas for our later meetings that go into the beyond lead um, strategies. I also just wanted to note that that quality of life category is not the specific focus of this working group that's been the focus of other conversations. So we'd suggest not using most of your stars um, in that category. OK, now Monty is the time. Monty will pull it up and as he does that, um, feel free to ask questions. I don't know if anybody's still on a phone primarily. I think it might be trickier on a phone if you're having any challenges once you get it sit pulled up. Um, we can always throw things into the chat and Tiffany and I can translate into the Miro board. OK, one yeah, one helpful navigation tool in the bottom right corner. There's those zoom buttons. If you ho hover over that plus or minus, you can go to the fit to screen, which looks like two arrows going to vertical lines, and that will bring you centered onto the onto the work area. Down here in the bottom right, if you need to change your zoom. Um, otherwise, uh, do we have enough colored stars for each of the members, uh, guys? 
Yes, but not for Monty. Six, seven. Oh, okay. No, I, I won't vote. That's fine. <laughs> I've had so, plenty of fingerprints on this. So go ahead and pick your favorite color quick before somebody else gets to it. If you want to start dragging those stars. The credits are, you know, each line that says either prereq or credit. Those are all up for grabs. Uh oh, we have. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything either. You guys aren't seeing anything. Um, are you seeing a, a white screen? Yeah, it's just a white screen with some three wavy lines bouncing around. If you try going, do you do you see um, any navigation at the bottom? Or is it nothing? Mm -mm. Maybe it's just waiting to load. So I think we'll need a backup plan. It looks like most people are in it, though. So Chelsea and Russ are the only two that aren't seeing it. My screen, it says this is a private board. That's in there. He's playing dark blue. So Tiffany just shared in the chat what it should look like. Yeah, I'm not seeing that. OK, so the other option will be to share a link of this spreadsheet. Tiffany, would you be willing to take? Oh, actually, I have a screenshot ready. I will share a link, a JPEG in the chat. For those of you that are in it, there's a toolbar off to the left and the the second icon from the top, right below the arrow, is a sticky note, is a post-it note that you can grab and drop and just drop a note on as well. So if I come over here and do sticky note, um, figure out district energy. Yeah, uh, Becky, Tiffany, I don't have any other controls on my side that look like I could change any of the issues that folks are having. Okay, I'll send an email out to the group replying to this appointment with a screenshot of the scorecard. And then I think you can say maybe in the chat if you can list out your top six or how you want to distribute your stars. And then Tiffany, maybe you can be in charge of um, picking a color and putting them there. That sounds great. Russ, you're still getting nothing? Yeah, I'm still got nothing. Bummer. It might be I'm a city firewall or something. I'm not sure. I'm yeah. having an issue, I think, with Miro as well. I keep trying to sign in, but it's just bringing me to the same screen without any indication whether it's working or not. Hmm. It's, but it's asking you to sign in. You're not just seeing it on the shared screen and able to use it. That's right. Huh. I'm not sure how to get out of this uh, requesting me to sign in either. Yeah, it shouldn't. It shouldn't require a sign in. I wonder. Um, are you on a on the web browser version of Teams, or is it in the desktop? Yeah, I'm in the web browser. Russ, are you in the web browser? No, desktop. Okay. <laughs> I'm on a late 90s laptop. For those of you who aren't able to get in there, have you see, um, seen the email that has the email come through with the? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, okay, so six stars, and we're supposed to choose, like, we're supposed to star specific items on the list, or? Yep, so it could be walkability and bikeability, one star, organic waste treatment, two stars, or three stars, or, you know, just one star for whatever. Yanni, were you able to get in? Are you seeing the board? I'm, I'm seeing the, the copy via email. Okay. If you're distracted, if you're in the board and you're distracted by seeing all of these visiting explorers and creators moving around, you can hover, you can click on the hide collaborators cursors button, which is at the top. Right, it looks like an arrow with a couple of lines next to it. Hear me? Yeah. Under the checklist here, where would worker quality of life at their job? So, uh, John, that really would fall in this quality of life category. And like we were talking about, this this group is really focused on the box of environmental sustainability. Um, we do have an ongoing process talking about uh, some of the course agreement, uh, community benefit agreement type issues. Uh, and then we can get you plugged into that discussion, but it's a little outside the, the box of the environmental sustainability stuff we're focused on here today. Well, I'm coming at it from worker areas, tax energy use. Should put that in start. Why don't you, uh, if you're in the board and can use it, throw a post it note up with that on it or just type it in the chat? Okay. You were breaking up a little bit on me there. Water quality PFA stuff. Thank you, Chelsea. Looks like we've got three out of seven that are able to use the board. Oh, Chelsea, you're putting them up for Chelsea. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Sorry, tell me again. John, we're not we're not hearing you. We get a post. Uh, How, you got that, Monty? How to get a post-it note? Yeah, over on the left side, uh, there's a toolbar on the left side of the screen, right below the arrow. The second one from the top is a sticky note. Mine, mine is the <coughs> from the top. Oh. Thank you. This is what happens when what happens when that democracy collides with technology. <laughs> uh, 
Um, whoever's in light blue, they've got a star on light pollution reduction and resilience planning, and it's kind of right on the line. I can't tell if it's light pollution or resilience. Right there. There we go. Does anybody want to share any ideas that might sway where people are putting their last stars? John, I'm surprised you don't have any over in the materials and resources area for mass yeah. timber and bodied carbon. Yeah, my uh, post-it note just kind of froze up here. I can't edit it and I can't get rid of it and I can't get my cursor. Oh, no. Uh, and I'm back. Yeah. But when I double click it, like it says to do, nothing happens. Do you want me to add a comment for you? Um, yeah, I was speaking about earlier when it's uh, breaking up was that my concern was for the quality of life for, uh, by having natural light. Uh, a requirement in the buildings for all work areas um, and uh, that ties into energy uh, efficiency. Gotcha. I guess I'm going to start there. Yeah, that's helpful. And I can't, I can't, I could earlier. <laughs> I had quite the rainbow going here. I'm going to take another screenshot for those who haven't been able to see the progress. Is there green, light green, and light, light green? Or is one of them teal or aqua? Yeah, I'm the dark green one. Yes, who's ever teal and aqua? Anyway. Keely had a question about lead requirements for organics recycling, and there is in that credit under materials and resources organic waste treatment. There is a requirement around organics recycling there. And Monty, do you remember that one off of the top of your head? I think it's. Yeah, we have to provide uh, organic waste collection. Um, and whether it comes from the city or whether we organize it just for this area, uh, and contract for it and cam uh, like uh, all of the land we sell it can still be subject to a common area maintenance charge almost like a homeowners association so we literally could set up a site specific uh, thing to the extent it doesn't exist or isn't provided by oh did I do that We're nearing in on the last few minutes, so we should probably, I think you can feel free to keep working on this. I think that if you have 
Teams um, on your desktop. You may be able to access this even after the meeting. I'm not positive about that. If you go into the, the meeting chat in your um, Teams, but otherwise we'll um, keep this running. I think Monty, if you're comfortable keeping it running until everybody has all of the comments they want um, sure. on the board and in the chat and and Tiffany will continue to get everything transferred over. Um, but I think we should probably um, spend the last two minutes talking about next steps as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, we've got two minutes to go. I'll leave this meeting running so if folks are still moving things around, they can or they can continue to send chats uh, even after others have left. Um, but I want to be respectful of, of folks' time. Um, so this next meeting, we are going to go uh, into a little deeper detail on the uh, carbon-free community uh, approach and solar approaches. Uh, we're going to go back to this scorecard and see what items you folks wanted to dive into, see if those line up with the areas that aren't very well fleshed out, uh, and see if we've got uh, things covered and where we really need to be spending our time moving forward. Um, we can walk you through in the areas you are interested in the strategies that we think generate the points in this framework. And granted, they are you know rigorous mathematical metrics that are some somebody's version of a best practice but you may very well have additional insight or knowledge or desires that are outside of what this group thought were the best practices for uh, smart mobility and transportation policy or whatever. Um, so we'll get into that process in the next meeting. Um, did I get that right, Becky, Tiffany? I believe yep. so. Yep, Pat? that sounds good. Covenants. Are there draft covenants? Have they been written for the site? Uh, we have an internal draft that LHB and the port have just been kicking back and forth just to get something on paper. Uh, it's nothing we've shared uh, publicly yet, but uh, we will be bringing those draft covenants. There's an urban design work group that's working right now uh, that meets on Thursday evenings. Uh, so they're going to start seeing those covenants and help us populate those covenants. This group is going to see those covenants and help populate those covenants. Um, but I don't think there's a document that we're ready to start being out in the wild here yet um, because we really have just started throwing it, cutting and pasting out of what was and starting to dream about what could be. Oh, did I do something? Um, hello? Oh, there we go. Sorry, I lost my screen. I uh, freaked out for a minute. Um, any last closing thoughts, comments? Um, we should all have each other's emails on the email chains from the appointment. Um, if there's a thought or a comment or a priority that hits you in the middle of the night, feel free to uh, send it in uh, via email to this group. Uh, we're happy to continue to populate the conversation. This is kind of just getting everyone onboarded and seeing where people's interests uh, and values lie and uh, moving forward. So thank you all so much for your time. Have a great weekend uh, and really appreciate uh, your willingness to help us out here. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Get a final snapshot of that. Did uh, Mike say stuck on validating URL?
just not the signature. Across the screen with the lead checklist, so I'm attempt to rejoin the meeting. That shouldn't be a problem, right? No, as long as as long as I don't shut it down here, John. We lose Tiffany. Yeah, she did say that she thinks she got through the whole checklist. I'm just doing a little double check here. Okay. Uh, looks like the toddler is waking up here. Okay. She, her daycare was shut down due to COVID Wednesday, and she's had a fever of 101 plus. Oh no. She's been testing negative, but. Uh, yeah, so we're on we're on juggle duty. Yep, our our um, nine month old is home. Too. But she just tested negative, so that's good. Oh, Tiffany's waiting. John, you got three devices logged in here. You're a master of technology. <laughs> Trying to admit Tiffany. It's admit not Tiffany, it's, it's not back finally. So uh, let me let me in. Yeah, I'm having the same problem, Monty. Problem, Monty. Seeing an action fail. Oh, there, there she is. is. I think John is in here uh, trying to leave post-it notes or stars or there he goes. Or who's that? Is that you, Tiff? I'm doing some post-it notes, okay. but not stars. Well, it was a semi-successful operation. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be a pandemic if it worked for everyone, right? Yeah. Hopefully we're, I think we've, we've got the end that we need. It just wasn't pretty. So, uh, Monty, you mentioned 900,000 square feet. Is, is that for industrial only or? The residential also. Uh, that's the industrial square footage and it kind of wiggles. Uh, we need to get to about 850, uh, 850,000 square feet to hit a thousand jobs. Sure. Um, that's we, our minimum density is one job per thousand square foot. Historically, we've performed at about 1.5, 1.6 jobs per square foot, you know, 50 deals over 25 years. Um, and so we modeled, I think, 1.25 as being at a gross level, you know, doable, which gets us a little over a thousand jobs on 850,000 square feet of light industrial. And that's. Uh Assuming a single story for all the industrial buildings. Yeah, yeah. The, the planners really wanted to push us to start modeling. Really, they wanted to give us less land for light industrial. Because they were asserting that, you know. Well, in Portland or in, uh, you know, Berlin, they build two story stuff. Well, in our marketplace, two story manufacturing space does not happen. Uh, it's just land is too cheap. There's too much of it. Um, if we told everyone they had to build two story light industrial space, we would wind up with a lot of raw land sitting here for a long time. Sure. Um, you know, Vomella has a pretty nice mezzanine space. Um, Warner Stallion, uh, they've got some pretty nice mezzanine space, but the, the owners, developers, brokers will tell you a lot of that mezzanine space is seen as a as detracting of value in the marketplace, because on resale, you don't know if the next owner needs that much office, wants that office, maybe they need the clear height. And so 
there's some issues with assuming everyone's going to measure their office space as well. Sure. Yeah. We, we can we can make the market, John. We just can't break the market. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> and I know you're going to be pushing us to break the market. <laughs> Uh, tower side aqua for uh, now what what is that so tower side innovation district is over there uh, right kind of in between the two cities over by on the U of M campus uh, wall companies is the developer that's building some I believe multifamily with probably some ground floor commercial stuff over there uh, and they have committed uh, and I believe evergreen is deploying an aquifer thermal energy storage district energy system right now as well um, I, last I heard, it was under construction. They had gotten permission from the State Department of Health uh, to use the aquifer in this manner. They had gotten some kind of letter assuring them that they would be able to get it permitted. Um, and so that would be, I think, the first deployment of an ATES system in our climate region. Is there a study or, or something, an, an engineering analysis of how they pulled that off? That can that I could get a hold of. You know, I I don't know. Um, we could share with you uh, uh, Evergreen. We paid Evergreen to do uh, an analysis, kind of an alternatives analysis for this site, which resulted in us selecting that ATES. I could send that to you. Um, I know over at Tower Side they did just complete their aquifer study. Uh, you got to spend about a hundred grand drilling into the aquifer to make sure it's capable of doing this thermal transfer thing right. Um, and that came back positive. So Ken Smith, the president of Evergreen, we were on a call with Excel a week or so ago. His assertion was that uh, we would be using the same aquifer here. And the assumption is if it worked and it passed muster over at Tower Side, it would also work here. But we would also still have to spend a hundred grand drilling wells over here into the aquifer to prove uh, it will work from a thermal dynamics standpoint. Sure. Okay. But I, I can share with you anything I can get my hands on. Let's put it that way. We're a public entity. Okay. And Tower Sides, a private uh, investment company. Uh, it's the name of the development. I think the whole thing is actually called Tower Side Innovation District. So if you Google Tower Side Innovation District, you know, Twin Cities campus, Minneapolis, something, um, you'll find a bunch of stuff about it. I think it was more of a, a coalition that dreamt up this district. And now the wall companies is one of the first uh, large developments going into the district. Does that sound right, Becky, Tiffany? Mm -hmm. The one of the tricks, uh, I believe the wall company, the way it's been explained to me, the only way I got financed was the wall companies had to agree to pay the debt service on the bonds to build the thing, even if the buildings didn't come out of the ground such that the buildings were paying uh, energy, energy charges to pay off those bonds. Basically as a backstop, uh, the private sector developer had to agree to be responsible for debt service payments that weren't being paid by energy users. That's kind of a, Risky proposition, unless you're pretty goddamn sure those buildings are going to come out of the ground. Yeah, and is the method of heat extraction uh, uh, in the building's heat pump? Uh, my vague understanding of these systems is it's all heat exchangers and heat pumps. And beyond that, uh, I know there's a David Williams. Maybe you've talked. We've introduced you to David at LHB, have we not, uh, John? I think so. Their mechanical he's, engineer. He was involved with that. Okay. Uh, he's been working on our side on the LHB team uh, as a mechanical engineer, helping review this stuff. Um, so he understands a little bit more about what that equipment is. That's really not my area of expertise. Sure. Sure. I listen to guys like him and you and try to learn. Yeah. Well, that's fast. That's fascinating. Um, ever since you mentioned that a while ago. Been thinking about how that would work, but didn't even know where to start as far as learning about it. Um, let's see, land covenant. Okay, that's all my questions. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Have a great weekend, John. Thank you so much for your time, buddy. Okay, yeah, we'll see you later. Bye bye. See ya. Bye. Bye. Um, have you guys seen uh, the rough cut of the video with him in it? 
Mm -mm, I haven't. Let me forward it to you. Uh, there's some edits, obviously, that are going on, but this was the first cut. Do you want to end the recording, Monty, so we can uh, end the oh. record of the meeting? Yes. And we'll we probably need to cut that part, this whole <laughs> 13 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, stop recording. <laughs>